Good evening. President Trump said to be in a red hot rage. We've got breaking news on the focus of his fury. Two items, in fact, tonight. One involving the possible firing of Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who okayed the searches yesterday, targeting the president's personal attorney, Michael Cohen. CNN has learned the president is not just grumbling about Rosenstein, he's actively discussing getting rid of him and even laying the groundwork for it. The second breaking story tonight concerns the possible firing of Robert Mueller. First, the Rosenstein News, seen as Gloria Borger joins us with the CNN exclusive. So what are you learning specifically about President Trump and Rod Rosenstein? Well, what we're hearing is the president is uh, is discussing with advisors about whether he actually ought to fire uh, the deputy attorney general. As you know, he's been in his crosshairs for quite some time. But I think the Michael Cohn raid uh, has taken it to a very different level. And uh, this would all be, of course, firing Rosenstein would allow him to put uh, greater pressure on on the special counsel. Um, but there are lots of different voices in that room. There are people trying to calm the president down and say, wait, don't do anything yet. Some of his attorneys are telling us that he's not going to fire Rosenstein. Other attorneys are saying, look, it's up to the president. But some are making the case to the president, look, Rod Rosenstein is conflicted here. He is a material witness in this case. And we have a very good case to make against him if we need to, if we need to do that. And so um, they also believe that, you know, he's important to the Mueller case because, of course, don't forget, he wrote the memo about the firing uh, of Comey. And uh, they're saying, look, this is a clear conflict and we can make that case. And by the way, you've already made a good case about disqualifying the FBI because you think that their investigation has not been credible and has been contaminated. So the president wants to fire people, we are told, Rosenstein primarily among them, perhaps even Jeff Sessions. And of course, there's always the question about does he want to fire Mueller? Do we know he's going to do any of these things? Nobody does. What are your sources saying about the president's feelings on Mueller himself right now? <laughs> well, look, obviously he's got his problems with Mueller, too. Uh, I was told by a source that right now his rage is more directed at, at Rosenstein and at uh, Jeff Sessions. But they believe and the president believes that the raid on Michael Cohn crossed a red line, I was told, that he has run amok that he is now unchecked because, of course, Rosenstein approved that. And so he believes that that he is he is uh, not checking him the way he should. And therefore, uh, he he'd like if he had his druthers, I think he'd like to get rid of him, too. But there are members of Congress. You heard Chuck Grassley, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, say today that it would be political suicide uh, to do that. So I think the president is hearing from enough people about the firing of Mueller himself that he may not want to start that fire because it would be very di difficult for him to extinguish politically. Firing Rosenstein would not be as difficult. We also got more information about what the FBI was actually seeking in its searches yesterday. Yeah, and, and we talked about this last night, Andrew. We know that a great deal of the search warrant was about Stormy Daniels, the payment to her, the conversations that uh, that Cohen, that Michael Cohen, the president's attorney, may have had with the president about this and the campaign. We have since learned that there were also uh, issues uh, related to the to the payment to Karen McDougal, the uh, playmate that, of course, the president allegedly had an affair with. Also questions about federal election law. And we now know uh, there were also the search warrant was interested in Michael Cohn's personal investments uh, and the sale of those investments, which were taxing medallions, which at one point were quite valuable in the city. But now, of course, have decreased in value because of things like Uber and Lyft. So they're not only going into his personal finances, but, you know, but also the questions about these women. And don't forget that he has represented the president in dozens and dozens of illegal cases. And presumably that would all be in his personal financial uh, records, which he kept. Gloria Borger, thanks very much. Sure. Now more on the, uh, the special counsel, which is tonight's other blockbuster story. New reporting in The New York Times tonight. The headline reads, Trump sought to fire Mueller in December. 
which makes it now two instances that we know about. Maggie Haberman and Michael Schmidt share a byline on this one. Maggie is, of course, a CNN political analyst as well. She joins us by phone. So, Maggie, you had reported on the previous incident of, uh, of the president uh, apparently wanting to fire Robert Mueller, and which was stopped by Don McGahn, the White House counsel. Explain how this mm-hmm. all played out now again in just this past December. Sure. And, and Anderson, this is just one of uh, you know several instances where the president has uh, come pretty close uh, to to dealing with uh, dispatching with Mueller in some way. Um, this is one of the most detailed, and it's the one that's, I think, the most similar to what we are seeing right now in terms of Michael Cohen and why the president feels like that violated a red line. In December, uh, there were erroneous news reports uh, that Mueller had subpoenaed records from Deutsche Bank related to the president's finances. It's not clear that there was something specific that the president actually had at Deutsche Bank, it's not even clear to me that he did have um, loans current or money current with Deutsche Bank. Uh, I think that the notion of Mueller getting near his finances uh, drove him to a different degree of anger. He told lawyers and advisors this crosses a red line. He was furious. Uh, his lawyers worked hurriedly to figure out exactly what was going on um, and, and got a rare assurance and response from Mueller's folks, no, we did not uh, do that subpoena. That is not correct. And they were able to walk the president back from the ledge. But it does show you how close he can get himself. And I, I, I understand how many people in the White House have come to see this as part of the fabric of, of life there. Most of them dismiss this as this is just how he talks. He is blowing off steam. Um, one White House official said to me today, um, you know, don't you think that he has suggested firing Rod Rosenstein about 10 times today, and they were being sort of sarcastic, but the point being, he says this stuff a lot. However, in at least one instance, in the case of James Comey, the FBI director, he did fire him. Uh, so it's very hard to dismiss it all as, as just ventilation and blowing off steam. The president was ready to do this, I just want to be clear, because it crossed the red line that he had set Correct. or he talked about with you and your colleagues uh, in an interview. Correct. I mean, he or he thought it had. It turned out that it right. didn't. Um, but yes, it was that he felt that it had violated the quote unquote red line, which was what he had said in an Oval Office interview with my colleagues, Mike Schmidt and Peter Baker and myself um, uh, about the scope of Mueller's uh, investigation that, you know, that his charge is Russia and the things that are relate to the president's you know, finances or his family's finances would not be applicable there. I'm wondering how all of this, le- I mean, the story about the, the wanting to fire Mueller in December leads us to the moment we're in right now with the president apparently actively considering firing Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. I, I mean, I think that, again, I think this is, this is something that, a line that he repeatedly walks up to, and in the past, and to Gloria's point, there um, uh, often are people, and there still are, telling him this is a very bad idea that has happened before. It is often some combination of um, lawyers, legal advisors, friends, White House advisors. There are fewer of those people now than existed before. Uh, and I think that that is part of what makes this more precarious. Uh, add to that the fact that everyone I've spoken to, and I think the CNN's reporting is similar, everyone I've spoken to says this is, this is different. The, the, the president's um, level of, of frustration and, and I would use the word helplessness because he has no control here, and there are a few things that drive him crazier than that, um, are, are at a peak. He is doing what he always does, which is sitting and watching watching us talk. He's watching television. He's watching news. Um, and he is getting very, very angry. The moods are not constant. It is not every second of every day. Um, but it is creating a, a sense of uncertainty uh, in the White House that is different than the usual churn we have seen. Fascinating. Meg Habern, appreciate that. I want to bring in our panel, legal and journalistic. Uh, Josh Campbell is joining us, Jeffrey Tubin, and Carl Bernstein. So, Jeff, this new, uh, the New York Times reporting, did the president, I mean, he did draw that red line when it came to his finances in Deutsche Bank. Um, does it make sense to you that, I mean, just in December, for the second time, he would have been talking about firing Mueller? It, sure, it makes sense, given what we know about the president and his character. But you know, let's just step back and, you know, remember, this red line is something of his own invention that he thinks is some line between appropriate and inappropriate. It's important to remember that we are talking here about a president who may be firing Justice Department officials and prosecutors for doing their jobs. Rod Rosenstein has done nothing wrong. 
He has done his job. Yet it seems like, and I certainly believe the reporting of our colleagues, that he is on the verge of losing his job because he did the right thing. So I think it is totally believable that the president is considering far firing Rosenstein, that he almost fired uh, Mueller in December and earlier last year. But we can't lose perspective on the fact that this is wrong. This whole approach to being president is wrong. But this is how well, things are working. Jeff, I mean, the other thing about this reporting is that the president was about to fire Mueller for something that turned out not to even be true. I mean, that, right. that there was no subpoenaing of his bank records at, at Deutsche Bank, if he even had bank records there. What does that say to you about how sensitive he is about all of this? Well, it, it, I mean, it, it says that, you know, he is deeply uh, worried about his personal finances being looked into. He has invented this standard that there is some red line, as he said in this uh, interview uh, with The Times several months ago. But this red line is not some sort of legal concept. It, it is a personal um, indulgence. It is a personal uh, imagined rule that the president came up with. And, you know, the, f fortunately, I guess for the world, the, his lawyers checked out that the, that the um, subpoena never even happened. So this uh, crisis was forestalled, but we seem to be heading for another one, this time aimed at Rod Rosenstein, at least initially, instead of Bob Mueller. Yeah, I mean, Carl, just in terms of the reporting that the president, you know, is considering firing Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, do you feel like we're on the verge of a Saturday Night Massacre here? Because what would be the point of firing Rosenstein if it's not in order to have some sort of impact on Mueller and the investigation? We're in a constitutional crisis. The president of the United States has made clear to those around him, as those who are closest to him in the White House and among his friends, that he is determined to shut down this investigation. And the moment he has chosen to actually act on it, apparently, is when the special prosecutor and other prosecutors have gotten hold of his lawyer's computers, uh, which have perhaps evidence uh, of real conspiracy between the President of the United States and others. Or there could be exculpatory uh, information there if, as the President maintains, and few uh, even around him believe uh, that there is no there there and that this is a, a really a witch hunt. We have a President of the United States willing to risk a constitutional crisis for this nation so he can avoid legitimate investigation and letting the facts roll out the way they ought to to the end of an investigation. And if it's a witch hunt, there is plenty of time at the end and there'd be hell to pay if Mr. Mueller or anybody else, Rosenstein, were conducting a witch hunt. This is no witch hunt. This is about a lawless president of the United States determined to avoid accountability. Josh, would, would firing Rosenstein necessarily get what the president likely wants, which is the ability to contain the special counsel investigation? Well, so there are two prongs here. I mean, the first is he can set additional parameters. So let's take the example of firing Robert Rosenstein. They put in someone in place who's actually maybe going to do the president's bidding and further narrow the scope of what Bob Mueller can do. That's one option. If they dissolve the special counsel completely, that doesn't make the investigation go away. So you send the FBI agents home, you send the prosecutors back to their districts. The case will still continue because the FBI, if they're in possession of information or allegation of a crime, they're not simply going to stop investigating simply because they they don't have that process in place. Wait, wait a second. I, I actually, no, I, I think that's uh, overly optimistic uh, sure about you know, the, the work of the FBI. If Robert Mueller is fired and and the this investigation, uh, you know, technically still exists, but there's no one in charge of it. Donald Trump wins. I, I didn't I mean, say I, he, I didn't say he didn't win. What I'm saying is that the counterintelligence agents at the FBI that are working the case, they don't simply go away and you don't shred your files and, you know, case closed. That actually requires a process. And if there's additional information, if there's an allegation that there's a crime, they don't simply stop investigating. That right, but if continue. there's nobody like a Mueller yeah, running on, the investigation I mean, they, they, and they, with they, the powers that Mueller has and the team that he has assembled, isn't it effectively over? I mean, Jeff, it would be effective. Yeah, of course, it would be. It would be over. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the idea that the FBI could sort of do this on its own is just it's not it's not realistic, much as much as we admire the good work of the FBI. I mean, this is why we have independent counsels and special counsels is because they have to lead investigations that are independent of the political 
superstructure of, of of the president's party. But, but Jeff, in terms of uh, of the impact on Mueller, potentially of say Rosenstein is fired, he would then be, uh, I assume, replaced by uh, the person under him, who would then oversee the Mueller investigation. To whatever At the effect, moment, we, don't know. Uh, we we I mean the the, the <laughs> we're we're in some uncharted water, waters, especially because there's no associate attorney general at this point. I think it would be the solicitor general, um, Noel Francisco, or it could be another person designated by by the attorney general um, to 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 supervise to supervise Mueller. But um, you know, at least initially, I don't think there would be any change in the Mueller investigation. But if a new person came in and started restricting uh, what Mueller could do, that would be a very serious limitation on his power. Carl, Let me cut to the chase here, yeah. if I may. Senator Grassley, the Republican uh, head of the Judiciary Committee, said today it would be suicidal if Trump were to fire Mueller or try to shut down this investigation. According to the people I talked to who talked to Trump, uh, he's willing to take that bet. It is not suicidal from his point of view. What is suicidal, perhaps, from his point of view is to let this investigation run on and the facts become known to the American people. So he may be betting that, indeed, if he shuts down this, uh, this uh, investigation, his base is strong enough and his appeal to that base uh, that this has been a witch hunt is resonant enough that it can carry the day. And I would not necessarily bet against him carrying the day with that kind of message and the kind of so cold civil war that's going on in this country right now that's been, uh, that's been exa uh, exasperated. Well, he certainly uh, set the scene for the, I mean, he's been kind of laying the table, uh, setting the table for you know, uh, an assault against the FBI, an assault against the Department of Justice, whatever form that may take, whether it's firing Rosenstein or, or Sessions or whomever. It's a campaign. Uh, We're seeing a campaign underway, essentially, to discredit. And this shows you when you have the collision of politics and law enforcement, this is the result. I mean, these are people that do this for a living, conduct these political campaigns. So if you look at, you know, all the attacks, they're simply softening the ground, laying basically for this moment that we're seeing right now. So if and when they do decide to remove Mueller, to remove Rosenstein, they can look back and say, we told you these folks were corrupt from the beginning, and so now we're going to move on to someone else. And, and Donald Trump runs the Republican Party. You know, if he were to fire Mueller, uh, in, at least in terms of what the Republicans would do, Paul Ryan would say, oh, I'm very concerned, and Marco Rubio would issue one of his statements that says, oh, I'm very, you know, very concerned about this, and nothing would no. happen. we got to take a, Nothing would happen. We've got to take a quick break. Oh, we'll bring the panel back. We'll also bring you even more breaking news that just now coming to light about what unfolded yesterday on the same day of the FBI raids. Later, Stormy Daniels' attorney joins us to talk about today's developments and how this affects his client and their case, as well as the fact that she is now uh, cooperating with investigators. The right sheets can take your sleep and your style to the next level. With Bowl & Branch, the upgrade has never been more affordable. Every set is crafted from 100% organic cotton. They get softer and softer over time. That's why they have thousands of five-star reviews, and even three U.S. presidents have Bowl & Branch sheets. Try them for 30 nights, and if you don't love them, send them back for a full refund. Go to BowlandBranch.com today for $50 off your first set of sheets, plus free U.S. shipping with promo code CNN2. Spelled B-O-L-L and Branch.com. That's BowlandBranch.com, promo code CNN2. There's yet more breaking news surrounding yesterday's raids, which have now triggered the president to contemplating the firing of Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein and perhaps Robert Mueller or uh, even Jeff Sessions. CNN's Evan Prez joins us now with new word on a meeting at the White House yesterday involving members of the Mueller team and the president's lawyers. So explain what, what you know about this meeting, the timing of it. Well, Anderson, let me just set the scene real quick. Uh, the president's legal team had a scheduled meeting, a pre previously scheduled meeting with uh, Robert Mueller's team to discuss what they've been talking about, which is the president having an interview, a potential interview with Robert Mueller's investigators and the mechanics of how that might happen. And so in the middle of having all of this, uh, these preparations, uh, we're told that uh, they learned that this raid was going on in New York, uh, where three locations connected to Michael Cohen, the president 
president's personal attorney were being raided by the FBI. So obviously this, uh, we're told, uh, was made for a, a very, very awkward meeting. Obviously, these are very sensitive negotiations that have been protracted for some time, trying to decide when and how, if uh, President Trump would sit down for an interview with Robert Mueller. And then in the middle of all of this, they learn that the president's attorneys, uh, you know, his residence, his, ho his hotel room and his office were being raided. And obviously now everything changes. Uh, we're told uh, that uh, no decision has been made as to whether or not that interview will go forward, Anderson. We got a statement from Jay Sekulow, who declined to comment on, on, on what we're reporting here. He said, we do not discuss con conversations we've had uh, nor have had with the special counsel, Anderson. So it's not clear if the president is reconsidering or, or considering still sitting down with the special counsel. Well, I'll tell you, we're told that uh, this, uh, this, this raid definitely has upended those discussions. I think it, uh, people we've talked to have told us that uh, it's certainly making them reassess uh, whether or not anything that w came about from this raid, whether that changes the calculations for the president. After all, uh, Michael Cohen's most important client is President Trump. So if there's materials that were recovered here by the FBI that changes the calculations, they're going to have to take that into account. Yeah. Anderson. Evan Perez, thanks very much. Let's get right back to the panel. Jeff Tubin, uh, Carl Bernstein, uh, and uh, Josh Campbell. Josh, I saw a tweet you sent out, I think it was earlier today. You were saying that you were talking to a former colleague of yours at the FBI about search warrants being issued on uh, an attorney's office. And just what, what did the, your former colleague say about this? Pointing out how rare it is. And what he was saying, you know, in his quip was that of 20 years in law enforcement, it, the number of times I've seen when an, a, an attorney has had their premises searched, it's been rare. And then he ended with all of those attorneys went to prison. And so, you know, it shows the gravity. Obviously, we've talked at length about how big of a deal it is and how many hurdles you have to go through, how much approval has to be, you know, in place before you would have that something like that take right. place. It shows it's a big deal, but it also shows, you know, if you look at the government that, you know, a lot of times there are, there are fruits to these endeavors, and sometimes that means jail time. Jeff Tubin, I mean, when uh, now that 24 hours or so has passed since we've learned about this raid, can you just put into context, I mean, to, to Josh's point, how unusual this is? I mean, it, after a while, it just seems normal, like, oh, yeah, okay, the FBI raided uh, the president's attorney's, you know, home office and hotel room where he happened to be staying. In the big picture, how... How nuts is this? Well, I mean, it, it is just so unusual. And Josh, you know, it, it w was certainly right in his, it, his exchange with his former colleague in the FBI. I mean, the, it is very difficult to search a, a lawyer's office um, in, in, in a constitutionally protected, w a permissible way because so much of what lawyers do is covered by the attorney-client privilege. And even if you have a search warrant, you don't have the right to read materials that are covered by the attorney-client privilege. And, and the, the way the government usually deals with this problem is they bring in a separate team called the Taint Team who looks through all this material, decides what's privileged, and then withholds that from the actual investigators. So the investigators who are you know investigating Michael Cohen, they don't see the fruits of the search right away. It has to go through this taint team first, which is a very cumbersome and difficult process, something the government certainly wants to avoid as much as possible. And they do very, very rarely. I mean, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, I had situations where I wanted to subpoena a lawyer, which is, you know, a much less intrusive phenomenon. And that had to go to Maine Justice, the United States, you know, the, the, the Washington headquarters, not in Brooklyn where I was, um, to get approval. A search warrant is far more intrusive than a subpoena, and it happens very, very rarely. Carl, it's also extraordinary when you consider the potential importance of Michael Cohen to everything that Donald Trump essentially has done in the time that Michael Cohen has worked for him. I mean, Michael Cohen has described himself as the fix-it man. His friend has described him as, you know, Donald Trump's fixer. If, if it's true that he paid Stormy Daniels $130,000, or as he said, facilitated the payment uh, using his own money with no, uh, without even informing his client, Donald Trump, there's no telling how many other sorts of interesting arrangements exactly he has right. been involved with whether the whether you know Donald Trump knew about it or allegedly didn't know about it this this raid is not about as Trump would have it the civil liberties of his lawyer 
This raid is about scaring the hell out of the president of the United States because he knows better than anyone what he and his lawyer have discussed, communicated about. And this has been Trump's biggest nightmare uh, throughout this investigation. And has it crossed a line? It has. It's crossed a line in which Trump can no longer, according to people close to him, can no longer afford to let the factual basis of this investigation go forward. We now have a president of the United States who is willing to undermine the concept that no one is above the rule of law in this country, including the president. He is willing to throw that away and undermine our national security irredeemably and irrevocably in this country by shutting down this investigation. That's and where we are. Remember let me what... add one thing about the, that Jeff said, uh, and that has to do with this tainted process of looking at the fruits of the uh, of the raid. If those investigators find evidence of criminality, suggested criminality uh, and conspiracy between the president and his lawyer, that evidence goes back to the Mueller investigation. It does not stay with the Southern District of New York if it's related to Russia in any way. And that also is yeah. a huge factor in this uh, Jeff, uh, constitutional well, crisis. Well, I just I just wanted to make that point that, that you know, that remember what the president said. This this search was an attack on America. Yeah. That's what he do. Remember, he used that term. Right. I mean, that gives you some sense of how he views himself at this point. It is an authoritarian vision of, right. of the United States at this point. I want to thank everybody coming up with some Republican lawmakers are saying today about whether they think the president will try or should try to fire Mueller. We'll hear from Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal of the Judiciary Committee as well. Hey, it's Howard Beck, and I've got Ray Allen on Bleacher Report's The Full 48. If a team could make me an offer that I couldn't refuse at that point, you know, once 2015 came and then 2016, it was like, there's nothing really that enticed me that would make me say, you know, I'm going to get off the couch and I'm going to really consider this opportunity because my kids were much more important. So check out The Full 48 now on the Bleacher Report app or subscribe at Apple Podcasts. Breaking news tonight, CNN's Gloria Borgia has learned that the president is considering firing Rod Rosenstein, which, if it happens, could put the special counsel at risk. There's new reporting also tonight in The New York Times that the president told advisors as recently as December that Mueller's investigation had to be shut down. It's a question that's loomed over the Russian investigation since the beginning, but it's certainly intensified in the past day and a half. Will the president try to fire Robert Mueller? As we reported today, Sarah Sanders said the president believes he has the power to do just that. Here's what some Republicans on Capitol Hill had to say today about that notion. Mueller should be allowed to finish his job. I think that's the view of most people in Congress. I think it would be suicide for the president to fire him. I think the less the president says about this whole thing, the better off he will be. I'm not concerned that he'll fire Mueller. I don't think he'll fire Rosenstein. I'm confident that would be the beginning, the end of his presidency, and he's not going to do that. And that would be a mistake. I think the best thing for the president and for the country is that Mueller be allowed to finish his work. I'm not going to speculate on something that I don't think will happen. I think the president is too smart to do that. Honestly, I am not that concerned. I don't believe the president would do that. Well, joining me now is Senator Richard Blumenthal, Democratic member of the Judiciary Committee. So, Senator Blumenthal, uh, a lot of folks on the Republican side say they don't believe the president would do that. This news now from the New York Times, the president wanted to fire Mueller back in December. If he wanted to do it then, is there any reason to believe he wouldn't also want to do that now? He certainly would have much more reason to do it now. This raid on his lawyer's office is like a nuclear strike with multiple warheads. The audacity of this raid and the need for it demonstrate that his lawyer not only has evidence of a crime, possibly implicating the president, but also that he was thought likely to destroy or conceal that evidence. Otherwise, the judge would not have granted this warrant. And so the implications for the president are absolutely profound and he is going through internal upheaval and turmoil that obviously is giving rise to these reports uh, from CNN that he's contemplating firing Rod Rosenstein. And remember, that warrant had to be approved at multiple levels in the Department of Justice by appointees of Trump himself. And so the Southern District of New York, which executed that warrant, 
did so with the express permission of Maine Justice and the professionals in that Southern District of New York office. So, so what happened? It, what happens if the president fires Rosenstein? I mean, would firing him be more palatable somehow than firing Mueller? Would it cause less outrage? Would it be safer politically? That is an excellent question. I think that firing Rod Rosenstein would provoke much the same reaction from my Republican as well as Democratic colleagues, one of outrage and intense opposition. And I welcome my Republican colleagues saying that it won't happen, it can't happen, he's too smart to do it. But we know that the president can be impulsive and rash, and I hope they are not in denial. In the meantime, I have worked and talked to my Republican colleagues privately behind the scenes because I think we are gaining momentum for legislation that I've sponsored along with Senator Graham and Senator Tillis and Democratic colleagues to make sure that the president is prevented from firing Robert Mueller, whatever happens to Rod Rosenstein. And I think we need to pursue that legislation. Well, I mean, part of the strategy from the White House, according to our reporting, is reaching out to key congressional Republican leaders to discuss options so they're not, quote, blindsided. Were you aware these discussions are going on? We had rumors. We heard those kinds of informal reports. There are a lot of swirling sorts of rumors here on Capitol Hill. And I think there's a sense of intense alarm here that is unparalleled during this presidency. There is a sense of impending catastrophe if the president follows through on some of the threats that he apparently has made privately to his own staff. That communication between the White House and Capitol Hill has been very much behind the scenes. But I think now is the time for my Republican colleagues to stand up and speak out and say not only that they doubt it will happen, but that firing Rod Rosenstein or Robert Mueller would provoke a constitutional firestorm that will engulf this presidency so, and would bring it down. Well, let me ask you about that, because, I mean, uh, there's a lot of folks who have not lived through a constitutional crisis or a constitutional firestorm or a catastrophe uh, like this, as you say. What would actually happen? I mean, what does that actually mean, um, you know, just in terms of nuts and bolts? What, what, you know, what happens? There are a variety of options, very hard to contemplate or describe with any certainty, but I think there would be, in effect, a shutting down of the United States Senate. If the President of the United States embarks on an illegal course of action, there would be a response on both sides of the aisle that would meet it. And let's reflect on where we are right now. The President is talking about firing Robert Mulley directly. That is a contravention of existing statute. 28 United States Code, Section 509, he's saying he believes that statute is unconstitutional. Therefore, he will take the law into his own hands. And that would be such an abrogation of the rule of law and his responsibility in his oath of office that I think it would provoke, in effect, a shutting down of the Senate. Even by possibly. Republicans? Do you think there are enough Republicans who would, who would do that? My hope is that we will avoid that outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think Republicans have to stand up and speak up now. But judging by their private conversations with me, yes, I do believe that they would take action that might well be regarded as extreme right now. Mm -hmm. Senator uh, Richard Blumenthal, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, new word that Stormy Daniels is now cooperating with investigators. Her attorney joins us uh, with that and more when we continue. I'm Mackenzie Atwood, and the Steven Universe podcast is celebrating the new Steven Universe animated episodes with many recaps. Join myself and the Crooniverse for a quick inside look at each new animated episode. The podcast fun starts April 17th. Watch the animated episodes on Cartoon Network and then learn more about them on the Steven Universe podcast. Subscribe for free at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. More breaking news. We learned that the FBI raid on President Trump's lawyer targeted records relating to payments to former adult film star Stormy Daniels and the deal involving American Media Incorporated and former Playboy uh, Playmate model Karen McDougal, who have both claimed they had affairs with citizen Trump. The White House has denied the affairs. There's another development tied to Ms. Daniels. A source tells us she is cooperating with federal investigators who are looking into her 2016 non disclosure agreement and $130,000 
hush money uh, payment from or that was facilitated in Michael Cohen's words. Joining me now is Stormy Daniels attorney, Michael Avenatti. Uh, first of all, you may not be able to talk about it or any specifics, but this idea that she's cooperating with the feds. Can you say anything about it? Well, Anderson, here's what I will say. Um, we were contacted uh, by various attorneys uh, from the government that are looking into this. We're going to cooperate fully. Uh, we're going to be as user friendly as possible. We're going to respect the process. We understand the seriousness um, of this. This took on a whole nother level uh, within the last 48 hours. Can you uh, say when you were contacted? But I'm, I'm not going to get into when we were contacted. I'm not going to get into the content of those discussions. What I will say is we're going to cooperate. Uh, and we're going to do whatever we can to assist that investigation. Uh, we're not going to require FBI raids to cooperate or to tell the truth. Uh, our entire intent for the last five, six weeks of this case has been to, uh, to expose the facts, expose the truth for the American people to learn as much as possible what happened here and to the extent that we can assist in the investigation and accomplish that, that's what we're going to do. I just learned uh, that apparently Stormy Daniels has, is going to be appearing on the cover of Penthouse magazine in May, gave a, a lengthy interview it's, uh, as described uh, to, to us. Do you know anything about that? Were you aware of that? I, I, uh, I'm not going to get into what I was aware or not aware. I'm not aware of, of, the, uh, of the appearance in the magazine as far as the details or what was said or, or what was not said. Okay. Um, the, we heard from Michael Cohen today uh, who talked to Don Lemon. Uh, when asked if he was worried, he said, quote, I'd be lying to you if I told you I'm not. Do I need this in my life? No. Do I want to be involved in this? No. He said that the, uh, the agents in the raid were professional, courteous, uh, and respectful, which is certainly uh, a far cry from the way the president described it as the, as the agents breaking in, into his office. Um, do you have any belief that what happened in, to Michael Cohen's office and his hotel room uh, and his, uh, his apartment or house is linked to what the president said just last week, in which he indicated that uh, Michael Cohen was his attorney, but, uh, but that he knew nothing about this, essentially saying that some people have suggested that meant that attorney-client privilege would not have been involved because Michael Cohen was not acting as the president's attorney in whatever he did with Stormy Daniels. Well, uh, let me say a couple things. First of all, uh, you know, while it may be good for CNN for, for Michael Cohen to be speaking to Don Lemon, it's moronic under the circumstances, and it really for Michael shows, Cohen to be saying anything. Yeah, I mean, if any experienced attorney would tell a client not to be speaking to the press the day after the FBI uh, executes three search warrants on your homes and your offices, I mean, it, it, this is just crazy. It's ludicrous. When I heard that he had actually spoke to Don Lemon, I didn't believe it until I saw Don's report, and lo and behold, I believe Don that it happened. Um, it, it's beyond stupid. So that's number one. I don't understand what he's doing. Um, that's first. Um, second. Uh, I, I still cannot believe that this, the president made these statements on Air Force One and effectively put his own personal attorney um, in the crosshairs by way of those statements, put the weight of the world really how did on. You, how are you saying that the president put, put him in the crosshairs? Well, by saying that he didn't know anything about it and that, that he basically referred everyone to Michael Cohen and he, say he has set Michael Cohen up to be the fall guy in my view. I said this last week and there is now uh, a false... Uh, sense of security, I think, on behalf of the president, that Michael Cohen's going to take the fall for this and that Michael Cohen's going to be able to withstand this amount of pressure um, and heat. Look, if you're going to have a fixer, you need to, there needs to be two attributes of that fixer. First of all, he better be really smart, or she better be really smart. And secondly, he or she better be able to withstand a significant amount of pressure, a significant amount of heat, and potentially go to prison for you. That's the best fixer you can possibly have. In my view, Michael Cohen doesn't fit either one of those uh, requirements. For all his talk of being incredibly loyal to uh, President Trump, then Donald Trump, uh, of being a guy who, you know, is the keeper of all the secrets, the, the tough guy, you don't believe that in the end he would go to jail for his client. I, I don't. I mean, I said this last night. If that, in fact, you know, was a possibility. Correct. I don't. I said this last night. I'm going to say it again. Any guy in my experience who has to constantly tell you how tough he is or refer to himself as Ray Donovan is not a tough guy. He's more he's closer to a purse puppy than a tough guy. I'm going to stand behind those statements. The problem is this. And it's been a constant problem, I think, for Mr. Trump. Um, over the last 20 years. He has not surrounded himself with the best and the brightest, brightest when it's come to lawyers and people around him. And you've seen that even more recently in the last 18 months. 
And now um, this is going to come home to roost as it relates to Michael Cohen. He picked the wrong fixer. He trusted too many personal secrets with Michael Cohen. And I think Michael Cohen is going to fold like a cheap deck of cards on Mr. Trump. And the results are going to be very, very bad. Michael Avenatti, appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, coming up, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg says he's sorry. We'll have more on what Zuckerberg said on Capitol Hill today about everything from privacy to the special counsel investigation. We'll also hear from Senator Amy Klobuchar on what she thought of his testimony next. Privacy, safety, and Subscribe to CNN Talk with me, Max Foster. Every day, we'll tackle the major news stories and talking points from a global perspective. Our panel discusses and debates the stories affecting you with comments coming in from all around the world. That's CNN Talk with me, Max Foster. Subscribe now with Apple Podcasts. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg says his company did not do enough to stop fake news, hate speech and foreign election interference and didn't do enough to protect uh, his customers' privacy. Zuckerberg was on Capitol Hill today testifying before the Senate Judiciary and Commerce Committees. In his testimony, Zuckerberg confirmed that his company is cooperating with special counsel Robert Mueller in its investigation to Russian meddling in the election. He also apologized for mistakes that led to the scandal involving Cambridge Analytica. Senator Amy Klobuchar today asked Zuckerberg about connections between that scandal and one involving the Internet Research Agency, which is a Russian troll group that allegedly tried to disrupt the election. You've also estimated that roughly 126 people, million people may have been shown content from a Facebook page associated with the Internet Research Agency. Have you determined when any, whether any of those people were the same Facebook users whose data was shared with Cambridge Analytica? Are you able to make that determination? Senator, we're investigating that now. Um, we believe that it is entirely possible that there will be a connection there. Well, earlier I spoke with Senator Klobuchar. Senator Klobuchar, were you satisfied with the answer that, that Mark Zuckerberg gave to your question today? I mean, do you think he understands the, the severity, the political ramifications of what happened within his platform? I think that he does. And I was actually pretty interested that he said that there may be a connection. I mean, that would point directly to the fact that this Cambridge Analytica data off of Facebook is somehow has some major overlap with what the Russian troll factory was doing. Um, and again, uh, I think that what we learned today uh, was that they know they'd have a major breach of trust with their users. Uh, they know that they're going to have to have some privacy regulations in place. And the whole question is going to be what those privacy rules are. But we just can't keep going and pretend they're just a site for cat videos and recipes. The, the answers that Zuckerberg gave to the Joint Committee today, I mean, do you think he was forthcoming in general with his answers? And, and do you think this actually did move the ball forward when it comes to any kind of possible Facebook oversight? Well, I think two, two things. One, he has said that he believes uh, that there should be some kind of rules of the road and regulations, which means a law in place. We haven't been doing that. All we've heard from them for uh, years is, well, no, 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 we can self-regulate, we're fine. And then the second thing is that he supported uh, the Honest Ads Act, which is my bill with Senator McCain and Warner, which basically says you've got to post all these paid political ads so the press can see them, your opponents can see them, and that includes issue ads, which is 90% of what the Russians bought, and that you also have to have disclaimers. So he supported it. Twitter joined them today in supporting our bill. And honestly, Anderson, we were just stuck. We weren't picking up more Republicans. So this makes a difference. And finally, they are voluntarily posting all of the ads. So starting in June, we're going to start to be able to see them. So let's say you've got a uh, NRA ad. Well, maybe they would just run that in rural and people in the suburbs couldn't see that a candidate was being attacked for gun safety legislation. Now they're going to be able to see it. But based on what you heard today, based on the information that you already knew, how concerned do you think Facebook users should be when it comes to the integrity of their information that Facebook has access to? I think that they should be very concerned. Every week the numbers go up. You know, we started at 30 some million, now we're at 87 million that went to Cambridge Analytica. And that's more than the population of California, New York, and Texas combined. And now we know there's 126 million people uh, whose information was somehow in the hands of the Russian troll factory. So this is, it keeps changing as they do their auditing. So of course everyone should be concerned. I think one of the questions I'm gonna ask on the record is, is it possible uh, that 
every American's data might have been shared. And that just can't be, and that's why we're going to need rules for data breaches. Um, so there can be notification if that occurs, and also rules to make it easier that you can be able to keep your information private. You know, I mean, not every senator, obviously, who asked questions today was part of the Facebook generation. Some senators, obviously, more media savvy or social media savvy, I should say, than others. Do you think that disparity at all got in the way of being able to more toughly question Zuckerberg? Yeah, I saw some Twitter feed out there about right. some of my colleagues. We'll just leave that between you and me and your audience. <laughs> okay. um, but, I, you know, yeah, but there's, you know, senators like Senator Schatz that have come along who has a very good understanding of this, Senator Warner, who's been in this business before. Um, and we have a number of us who've been working on this for a long time. Um, and I don't think that's an excuse. You can't use age um, as an excuse or cluelessness as an excuse to not do something about what is the biggest privacy concern concern and the biggest breach we've seen in a decade. You just can't do nothing. Mm. And so that's why I think you're going to start seeing bills coming forward. I'm working on one, a bipartisan bill. You're going to start seeing some ideas come forward of how to regulate these companies. But the democracy work, the election work has to begin now. Yeah. Senator Klobuchar, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be on. Coming up tonight's breaking news, new details on how willing the president may be to fire Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein.